Okay, dear friends, I am immensely happy to address you for the IACTS con conference of this year. I am going to talk about tissue valves through the ages and down, focusing on a particular valve. I have no disclosures to make. And as we talk always about valves, which valve has to be used has been always a headache for the surgeons and cardiologists because of a multiple issues pertaining to both the valves. The nine commandments for the prosthetic valve includes prevention of embolization, durability, ease and security to attach, preservation of surrounding tissue function, reduction of turbulence, reduction of blood trauma, reduction of noise, use of compatible materials, and development of methods of storage and sterilization. An ideal valve should have good hemodynamics. It should be quiet. It should not require any anticoagulation. It, look, it should last for the lifetime. It should be affordable and easily implantable. When you think about a tissue valve and a mechanical valve, you think about the durability, less durability of the tissue valve, but with the good hemodynamic. And on the other side, the incidence of thromboembolism um, and bleeding related to anticoagulation. So we have to weigh both this uh, with each other to make a decision regarding which valve has to be chosen. In the Wall Street Journal of 2007, warfarin was declared as the second most likely drug after insulin to send Americans to an emergency room. Uh, by one estimate, about 43,000 patients are admitted to the emergency room per year in the United States of America. So for that reason, there is an increasing use of bioprosthesis now. The risk of reoperation is supposed to be less now with new technologies. The patients undergoing aortic valve replacement today are older population than those studies in the, the randomized trials in the past resulted in which the valve longevity will be much more increased and so on. Most of the factors are favoring the increasing use of bioprosthesis now. From the flowchart, we can understand that if a durable valve repair is not, if it is possible, definitely we go for the valve repair. If it is not possible, and if the life expectancy is supposed to be less than 15 years, definitely we go for a tissue valve. Or if the life expectancy is 15 to 30 years or more than 30 years, if the patient is happy to accept the risk of reoperation for good lifestyle, still we opt for a tissue valve. The patient doesn't want reoperation and will take anticoagulation religiously for the rest of their life. We definitely opt for a mechanical valve. If the patient's characteristics do not sway the balance in favor of any particular valve substitute, the surgeon should use the valve which is most familiar for him, which will be the safest in his hands. Nobody should touch the depth of the river by both feet. That's the principle. Now, looking at the uh, evolution of valves through the ages, in 1970s, we had, early, in early 70s, we had first successful push sign bioprosthesis. Uh, on a metal stent. And in 1976, Carpentier Edwards developed a Persian valves with Elgiloy stent, which is still being used for most of the valves currently. The first pericardial valve was brought by Inesco and Shiley in 1976, which did not last long because of the structural degenerative changes happening early in their life. In 1980s and 90s, stentless valve came into existence like SPV Toronto, um, and uh, Mitroflow and Carpentier Edwards um, came up with a bovine pericardial bioprosthesis in 1991. Currently, the valves available to the surgeons and to the patients um, are as follows. This is a magna is aortic, and this is a magna is mitral. Both are pericardial, bovine pericardial valves with excellent hemodynamics. The St. Jude has come up with trifecta valve to begin with, and then trifecta GT with minor modifications and ease to implant. The Medtronic has got a valus valve, which has got organ pericardial thing, but with a cinch mechanism, which will ease the surgeons, uh, the, the surgical technique of implantability and tying the sutures down. 
Also, we have got tissue root replacement, or this can be used as a root, or it can be used as a valve, or, or can be used as a cylindrical graft, depending upon the need. This is an excellent valve brought by uh, Freestyle. But now today I'm going to talk about a valve which is absolutely made in India. It is a daffodil uh, valve by Merrill Life Sciences, which has got mainly three components, a support ring, which is made up of acetyl polymer, a commissure, which is made up of PET film structure, and as I said earlier, alkyl alloy, alloy wire foam, which is all covered by polyester knit fabric. It's an excellent design, almost comparable with the recent uh, valves which is available in the market. Elgiloy is an alloy which is a super alloy consisting of cobalt, chromium, nickel, iron, molybdenum, etc., which is very much uh, corrosion resistant and exhibit high tensile strength, ductility, and good fatigue life. So it's 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 an excellent combination for the valve. Daffodil, the features, it is a triple composite design, as I mentioned earlier. It is uh, having a good anti-calcification treatment and it has been tested in vitro with 200 million cycles to, to prove the vitro viability as per the ISO standards. This is a mitral valve of uh, daffodil and this is the aortic valve. The ideal effective orifice area index should be, um, should be more than uh, 0.85 and most of the valves which is available in the market to satisfy this effective orifice area index. Daffodil tissue valve, our experience in Lissy Heart Institute in Cochin, we have started using it about six months ago. We have used many valves, but we have enrolled about 21 subjects into this uh, uh, study. We have 12 aortic, um, three double valve replacement, and, and 11 mitral valve replacement during this period of time. Uh, this is the, uh, the valve size distribution again. And uh, the demographic characteristics of the patient, the mean age was 70 plus minus seven for aortic valve and 66 plus minus 5.66 for mitral. Um, the male constituted about 75% of aortic and 54% in the mitral, while the female constituted 25% on the aortic and 45% percent on the mitral side. Other concomitant procedures we have done was along with aortic valve replacement. Isolated AVR was four, CABG combined with it five, double valve one and permanent pacemaker one. On the mitral side, we have isolated mitral valve, three numbers, CABG in four patients, double valve in three and a bendal using the freestyle I mentioned earlier, one patient. Now, the hemodynamic performance of daffodil pericardial prosthesis is shown in a chart here. We can see the pre-procedure gradient was very high. This is for the aortic valve and post-operatively it is 11.1 and at, at three months it was 13. So likewise, the diameters, various diameters are also shown here, which has significantly improved um, over a period of time. Again, this is in the graph way. This is the pre-procedure. This is the post-procedure immediately, and this is three months. The peak gradient has come down to 13.5 from 54 at the end of three months in aortic valve graphs. This is the aortic valve, which is an excellent uh, to Z, a good approximation of the cusp. So it has got three marks, which is shown there for easy suturability. Again, there is a very negligible drag force in this uh, where the suture can easily slide down and up, uh, facilitating the valve to go down to the annulus in a beautiful way. And here is one of the aortic valve, uh, the preoperative picture with severe calcific tricuspid valve with severe stenosis. And look at the beautiful uh, daffodil valve being seated, uh, ready for the sutures to be cut and removed. Now, when we come to the mitral valve, the hemodynamic performance of the mitral valve, um, the pre-procedure gradient of about 9.86 plus minus 3.76 has come down to 4.33 post-procedure and further down to 4.2 at the end of three months, thereby a lot of regression on the LV end diastolic and uh, uh, post-systolic uh, post 
diameters have been substantially improved after the valve replacement, which is shown again in the graph um, as a mean gradient has come down um, at the end of three months, about 4.23, and the peak gradient has come down to nine from 20. So it's a remarkable improvement in the valvular function. Uh, in, in NYHA class one for the aortic valve replacement at three months, the NYHA has come up to NYHA class one. So it's the case with the mitral valve replacement compared to um, a lot of percentage of patients preoperatively in class four and class three. The clinical outcomes of mortality has been none. The major bleeding has been none. Re-exploration in one patient, atrial fibrillation in two patients, and in aortic, two pacemaker implantation and mitral, one pacemaker implantation. This pacemaker implantation has been planned before surgery most of the time, related to un, um, un, unrelated to the valve of our choice. This is a mitral valve, which has got a, a rotator and has got a, a holding stand. On the back of it, you can see the threads coming down there, which once the rotator is pushed, will stretch and prevent the sutures being uh, caught into that. The mitral valve, daffodil, it, it is a excellent design, which has got a holder there. It is It has got markings for facil facilitating the suture, and also a holder will come there. And as I said earlier, some uh, suture holding preventive mechanism as it is in the pedimount valve also is a, a, a good uh, part of the design. Now we can see again, as I said, that there's a very low drag, a very low drag uh, feeling for the mitral valve as well. The comparison of hemodynamic performance of different valves, when it comes to different valves, we're comparing with the daffodil with the trifecta, which is one of the best valves available here. Again, you can see uh, mean gradient has been 13.5 against 11.7 and the peak gradient 24 against 21. The diameters have substantially reduced after the, um, the mitral valve replacement, um, sorry, aortic valve replacement and uh, compared to uh, tri comparable with the uh, trifecta performance. Likewise, uh, when it comes to valve size uh, to size matching, it's about this is a 19 millimeter. You can see the comparison between daffodil, trifecta, and pedimount. We have got very low mean gradients comparable with uh, those valves. And postoperatively, um, postoperatively, we can see the effective orifice area of the daffodil valve exceeds much beyond the other two valves which is available in the market. This is a 21 millimeter. This is a 33 millimeter, uh, sorry, 23 millimeter, and this is comparison with the uh, 25 millimeter where the effective orifice area is excellent postoperatively. And at the end of 12 months, it is almost in par or even better than the gold standards valves available in the market. Again, this is in the uh, in the form of a tabulation, daffodil, trifecta, and peribone magna. The effective orifice area is much on the higher side. The mean gradient is comparable. Effective orifice area again, um, mean area, mean uh, gradient also has been very much comparable with um, the standard valves in aortic position. This is again the, uh, the 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 chart, the bar chart, comparing all the three valves, which is excellent comparison. And the green color is obviously uh, the, the 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 daffodil valve uh, being referred. Um, here again, you can see the pre-operative, post-operative um, and 12 month results of all these valves and uh, they all seems to be comparable with the available valves in the market. This is regarding the mitral valve, comparing the mitral valve between daffodil and perimount. We can see the um, LV uh, diastolic diameter um, and LV ejection fraction um, after the cardiac surgery. The mean gradient is actually lower and the peak gradient is much the same comparing with the perimone valve. Here again, the same figures are there in a tabular form. And at the end of one year, again, when you come to the mitral valve, all the figures of all the sizes of valves are very much comparable or even much better when it comes to the effective orifice area compared to the perimone at the end of an year. So mitral valve, um, again, it is in the, in, in, in the tabular form. And as you can see, the 
clinical outcomes and hemodynamic performance of daffodil and aortic valve has been studied by a group of doctors from India headed by Dr. Hiramath, who is the secretary of our IACTS and have given excellent reports. And uh, for, from our point of view as well, we have found this valve very user friendly and uh, which shows extremely good results and uh, early uh, reduction in uh, peak and so that as well as mean gradients and an excellent effective orifice area. And for Indian population, the cost also is an important factor, which is very much affordable. And uh, we feel that uh, this is a, a great asset uh, to the field of valvular, valvular surgery in, in, in the field of cardiac surgery. I thank you very much once again. And thank you the organizers for allowing me to present our data, our short term data on um, daffodil aortic as well as mitral valve replacement. Thank you once again.